gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the Canberra Theatre and welcome to this very, very special event. My name is Virginia Hausiger and I'm delighted to be your MC and facilitator of tonight's very important discussion. And I warmly thank each and every one of you for turning up tonight on a Friday night in Canberra. Before we start, of course, as is tradition here in Canberra and indeed right around the country, I'm calling on one of our Ngunnawal knowledge holders to deliver the welcome to country. Richie Allen is a knowledge holder who was born in Ngunnawal country and Camilla Roy, raised in both. Richie's a Ngunnawal expert who provides advice on culture and creating safe workplaces for Aboriginal people to thrive on in. His expertise and advice is highly sought, hence Richie sits on numerous cultural boards. Please welcome Richie Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and, and welcome everybody. I've had such an important night for such a, a big occasion to get all the information you can. Like I said, I'm a Ngunnawal knowledge holder. The only reason I'm doing it is because Aunty Violet's on the panel for that. So accordingly, like I said, she asked me to do the welcome to the country on her behalf, which I'm always honored to do. Now, welcome the country is such an, an ancient tradition that included, when you're coming into someone else's country, you stopped at an area. How long you waited was, there was no concept of time, you waited until the respect came, the traditional owners came, to give you a smoking ceremony. So you, you didn't leave your cultural footprints on other people's country. I'm pretty sure that everyone can agree that, you know, that was a massive sign of respect, humility, and such an important cultural law. We are on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. The Ngunnawal people roamed this area for over 65,000 years. I welcome the country. We invite everybody with our open arms to come in and learn about Ngunnawal people. The Ngunnawal people are such friendly people and we invite you to come and learn who we are. Learn all mobs throughout Australia. This is the only way we will achieve true reconciliation. I stand here in respect the late Arnie Agnes. I pay my respects to Arnie Agnes and her family the matriarch of Ngunnawal people she was. Seen many things and many changes come through this land. And for that, I pay our respects to her and her family. And thank you for the contribution she made to the lives of not just Ngunnawal people, but all indigenous people and non-indigenous people. She fought hard and she was a very strong matriarch. I pay my respect to the Ngunnawal ancestors and the footprints they left behind in this beautiful country we call Canberra and region. I pay my respects to my matriarch, Annie Violet Sharon. If I don't mention her, she will absolutely slaughter me <laughs> at that. And thank her for the knowledge she passed down to me. Each and every day, I make sure I do something that pays tribute to the Ngunnawal people. I extend that respect to the other brothers and sisters that are here today and thank them for living on Ngunnawal country and contributing to those footprints that have been here for over 65,000 years. I also pay respects to the non-Indigenous people that walk with us side by side in the journey we call reconciliation. There is so much to do, but the fight is real and we will walk with you always. On behalf of the Ngunnawal people, Yan Yer Nyagu Nanadara Yamalandi Nanadara. Hello and good evening from the Ngunnawal people and welcome to Ngunnawal country. Thank you very much.
think the messaging from the Uluru Convention is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are going to take control back of this recognition process. I think what we heard from all the dialogues was overwhelmingly universal in that people wanted the tools to make an actual difference to their lives on the ground. We distilled all of the information that the 13 dialogues gave us and came out with a model that involved treaty making, a voice to the parliament and a truth commission. We cannot continue to go on anymore being voiceless and powerless in our own lands. So far we don't have any say in any legislation, any policy at all. So from here, what we're saying to Australia is this relationship between us, this very poor relationship, full of rampant racism and what have you, has to stop. The country has to be mature and sophisticated enough to have an intelligent conversation so we can all move forward and solve this unfinished business between us all, because it's definitely time. People want to make sure the truth is never forgotten and that we as Australians, we can talk truthfully about the past. We should never let the past be a burden uh, upon us, but at the same time, um, it will always be a burden if we don't face up to it. And denial, denial is no solution to that burden. In fact, the, the weight of that burden increases the more determined we are to try and force a denial and a forgetfulness about it. So one of the really strong messages from all of the dialogues but emphasised here this week is that the First Nations want our own people and the rest of Australia to engage in a process of truth-telling, uh, a lot like other societies that have been racked by division and the wounds of the past. A lot of other societies have established truth-telling processes to lay the groundwork for a more united future. And this is what our people have done here this week. In my work um, as a United Nations expert, um, I've been able to look across you know, the 70 countries of the United Nations who have significant Indigenous populations and see that that kind of voice to the parliament, that kind of parliamentary institution is quite a conventional um, uh, way that member states accommodate Indigenous peoples within the state. So it's no surprise to me that that has come up as a significant legal reform option for communities who feel like they don't have any power and they don't have any voice. And what we did hear from the dialogues right around the country is a very strong sense of powerlessness and voicelessness. People feel they don't have community control anymore. They feel like their communities are run from Canberra. And I think that's a really important message for the Prime Minister and opposition leader to, to hear, um, that communities feel so profoundly unhappy with the way Aboriginal polities um, are, are, are situated and located within the life of the Australian state. There's heaps of overlap, heaps of common ground, heaps of common themes, and of course the consensus was around us calling for a voice to parliament, constitutionally mandated. Um, it is a substantial proposal. Um, it's a critically important proposal. And the message um, that came out of the dialogues was unanimous on this and it was confirmed as the priority. But um, the hopes of our people are that it will be this voice that sets up the next stage of our movement towards agreement making under a Makarata Commission. The old idea of a Makarata is more than 30 years old. Um, it's a well-established idea, a Yolngu name for people coming together after a disagreement. And um, so the concept of the Makarata has been uh, re-invoked in, in our struggle and, um, and where the, the Uluru statement says that one of the functions of the Voice to Parliament is to advocate with, uh, with government the establishment of a Makarata Commission to supervise 
agreement making between First Nations and governments. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for coming along here tonight and giving up your Friday evening. We all come in good faith and share respect and come with, I think, a sense of celebration of our community and the fact that we can come together like this is something we should all be very, very proud of. It's an opportunity for our nation to engage in a very big broad discussion about the place and participation of First Nations peoples and voices in Australia's place of legislature, legislature, the National Parliament. Now, just yesterday, the Attorney General, as you know, introduced into Parliament the constitutional alteration legislation for the voice. So our timing today couldn't be better. It couldn't be more timely. And right now, in other parts of Australia, indeed in Tamworth, there is a similar town hall meeting going on right as we speak. And that one is hosted by Barnaby Joyce and Pauline Hanson and Alan Jones on understanding... <laughs> I know where I'd rather be. <laughs> But that uh, discussion is on understanding why you should oppose the voice. Now, that comes as a surprise, doesn't it? Um, these discussions will be held all around the country in coming days, weeks, months, and we can only encourage each and every one of you to have these conversations broadly with your friends and family and work colleagues. Um, it's so important we have these discussions. Uh, tonight, I think we are very honoured to have some of the, a couple of the key players uh, joining us who have come to Canberra tonight to, to kick off this very big public discussion right here with you and I. So uh, I'm, I will introduce the panel one by one once they come onto stage, but would you please welcome, uh, I'll introduce them formally as they sit down, but I'm going to call on Violet, Pat, Megan and David to take a seat. Like over there. I'll have to call a halt to that applause and we'll be here all night. <laughs> It's so lovely. Now, I do want to formally introduce each of our panellists to you, and I'm going to start with Violet Sheridan. Is it okay if I call you Auntie? Am I young enough to call you Auntie? Yes, you are. I, I have known, I've known Auntie Violet for a couple of decades since I first came to Canberra. She's done the Welcome to Country or acknowledgement of Welcome to Country just about every event I've ever done, and I feel like it's not right if Auntie Violet isn't there, so we're so pleased oh, to have you along you. here tonight. She's a pillar of the community in Canberra, as many of you would know, and our region, and a passionate Ngunnawal elder who shares her cultural knowledge and expertise with the entire community. And I'm going to add, she also very, very generously donates her time to event after event after event at schools, universities, um, as I say, just about every single event I've done, Auntie Violet has been there to support us and we're so grateful to have you with us today. Pat Anderson, AO, is an Aliyah woman known nationally and internationally as an advocate for the rights and health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, Pat, before I go on, am I young enough to call you? Well, and particularly because you asked. Thank you. Thank you. I'm never quite sure. Um, no, it's complicated. It is complicated. <laughs> and I, and, and, and I, you know, I'm not sure if it's an age thing too, but I'll go with Auntie Pat if that's all right. Uh, Auntie Pat was chair of the Lewitcher Institute for nearly 20 years and has extensive experience in Aboriginal health, community development, policy formation and research ethics. 
And Pat Anderson was made a officer of the Order of Australia, an AO, in 2014. And along with Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson, Pat was awarded the internationally renowned Sydney Peace Prize for 2021 to 22 for leadership in delivering the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people. A wonderful, wonderful choice. She was co-chair of the Referendum Council and since and who, who delivered their report in 2016 and since then she has led the work of the Uluru Dialogue in partnership with ILC University of New South Wales. Put simply, Auntie Pat Anderson AO is one of Australia's great elders and she cares deeply for the people and wants peace in this country. We are delighted to have you with Thank us you here Virginia. in Canberra. Professor Megan Davis, I almost feel like saying needs no introduction. We've, we're seeing a lot of her now and uh, delighted to have her with us tonight. How lucky are we? I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Megan is a Cobble Cobble woman of the Burragum Nation. She's Pro Vice Chancellor uh, at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Professor Davis is a Professor of Law and Director of the Indigenous Law Centre of the University of New South Wales Law. She's a renowned constitutional <coughs> lawyer and public law expert focusing on human rights of First Nations peoples. And she's been a leading constitutional, uh, uh, sorry, a leading lawyer on constitutional reform for the recognition of First Nations rights for two decades and has led the Uluru Statement from the Heart work for the past five years. I also want to add that uh, Professor Davis is globally recognised as an expert in Indigenous rights. She was elected onto the UN Human Rights Council to the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People based in Geneva, uh, twice elected to that, and she served six years as an expert member and chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in the UN New York from 2011 to 16. And I also want to add that um, Megan, indeed, with Luitcha, uh, was one of the women we chose when we were putting together an exhibition at MOAD on Australian women change, change makers. And um, so she's featured in, which I guess curated, and she's featured in that, and, and lent us the most beautiful, amazing fighting stick, which we might get to talk about. But I just want to say something that I, I spent a lot of time reading everything that had ever been written about Megan Davis, and I, I just want to share with you the words that we came up with for the exhibition. Megan Davis is a rare mix of piercing brilliance and beautifully uncomplicated compassion. She's a giant among Australia's Indigenous community and the nation's public intellectuals. She's forged a stunning and multifaceted pathway through both academia and Indigenous activism, always navigating progress with the big picture in focus. And I think that sums up beautifully Professor Megan Davis. And I unfortunately have uh, to let you know that um, unfortunately Senator Dodson couldn't join us tonight, although that was advertised that he'd be here, but he's had to return to WA for personal reasons, but he wants to extend his thanks and appreciation to all of those of you who've turned up tonight to join in this conversation. And he wanted to send a message, uh, a message of optimism, when he says that he wants people to know he continues to have, and I think this is beautifully put, he continues to have faith in the good-heartedness of Australians to carry this referendum with the respect and decency it deserves. And then he went on to say, a successful referendum can do no wrong. It will only serve to unify us, to strengthen the fabric of our nation. And last but not least, David Pocock, who I would like to say needs no introduction, in this town, he is ours. <laughs> he, of course, is the ACT's independent senator, the one to crack through after 17 years of a Liberal senator in that seat. Our first independent, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this event tonight uh, was David's initiative, and he, in fact, is, is host of it as such. So, David, I'm going to throw over to you, just first and foremost, before we get into the detail, oh, and I will let you know, too, there will be opportunity for questions. That's what we're here for. Um, I think there are microphones on stands, yes, at either side. I'm not going to take questions for the first 45 minutes or so, but we will get to it, and there'll be plenty of time for questions. We're here, we've got plenty of time, so don't worry. If your issue isn't dealt with in the panel, you can come to the side and uh, respectfully and um, warmly uh, ask your question of the panel. But I wanted to kick off with asking David why you felt um, a need to do 
this event. And, uh, and I, I just want to make reference to something uh, I think you said in the Canberra Times today, you were quoted as saying, there's so much at stake. Um, why is there so much at stake and, and why, why is this so necessary? Well, thanks, Virginia. <coughs> and thank you all so much for coming along. I guess my, I moved here as a teenager uh, 20 years ago and have fallen in love with Australia. It is, it is such an incredible place to live. And I guess over that time, have learnt more about Australia's first people and just the incredible uh, culture and knowledge um, that is held in this, you know, the longest continuing cultures in the world. And you know, I think like so many Australians, there is a real dis-ease with the, the, the way that things are structured and every week we're seeing news stories. And I think in, you know, in 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, this was obviously long before I even thought about going into politics, to me was just such an incredibly generous offer to all Australians. Mm. And to see the way that it was battered away by politicians mm. um, made me angry, to be, to be frank. Um, I, I do think it is an incredible opportunity for Australia to begin to address the um, yeah, ingrained disadvantage, uh, the, the, the racism that we, we, we still have to confront. Mm. It's not a silver bullet, but this is setting up you know, generational change, systemic mm. change. So, mm. yeah, I was, I was very excited about the prospect of something mm. like the Uluru State from the Heart being implemented in full and now being in the Senate and having an opportunity um, as a senator to be part of the conversation. Mm. I guess this for me is so important to centre this conversation on all of us. This isn't about politicians deciding these things. This is, this is a, an offer to all Australians. And so, yeah, I, I thought it was a great opportunity to get people here to, you know, hear from the people who've been involved in this for, for a long time. And indeed, it is an opportunity for all Australians and hence the sense of having a referendum. Um, I, I want to, before we get into the dialogues as such and, and take us through a little bit of the history of how we got to this point, Professor Davis, I, I want to, and I'm, I, you're too young to be called auntie, so I'm sticking with Professor yeah, Davis. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> no. No. But I, I want to ask you, you said, I just noticed you said something in the, the, um, the video there that, that struck me when you said um, we need to take back control of the reconciliation process. What do you mean by that? <coughs> um, well, I, I suppose what I mean is um, Bob Hawke originally introduced reconciliation kind of into the parlance and legal discourse of the nation when he couldn't deliver on treaty or national land rights. Um, and you can read what his cabinet said at the time about how you soften the blow to mob. Mm. And they spoke about a new process they spoke about Australians not really knowing mob and therefore one way of dealing with this was to kick the can down the road into a reconciliation process. Mm. Um, and that reconciliation process um, happened for 10 years. It was a statutory process, as you know, um, a Reconciliation Council Act. Um, and we know from those cabinet papers that originally the Act and the purpose of that council was about reconciliation and justice, mm. but they deleted the words and justice. Um, and so we went down this path of reconciliation. Um, after 10 years, after all of that incredible work led by people including Patrick Dodson, Linda Burney, etc., cetera, um, you, you get to the bridge walk period and you've got a new government um, in, and that government rejects all of that work that has come before and it creates a kind of false binary um, in terms of reconciliation. It, it takes rights, treaty, all of those really substantive reforms that Indigenous people have advocated for decades and decades in Australia, and it palms that off into what he called sub symbolism. Mm. And then he said, we're going to walk down a path of practical reconciliation. And that aligned with his government policies of... Um, um, uh, 
welfare restrictions um, and, and many other different policies that Howard introduced, which were aimed at what we would say citizenship rights. Mm. So there are actually um, policy settings that were delivering rights to our people that we should actually get because we're Australian citizens. Um, and so he, he split the reconciliation movement. And so truth and justice stayed here and he moved reconciliation down this practical, pragmatic reconciliation pathway. And Reconciliation Australia walked with him. And you saw the creation of something that's known as the Reconciliation Action Plans, RAPs. Mm -hmm. And you saw corporates and businesses step up to the plate and create RAPs. But nothing in those RAPs really spoke to truth and justice. And you never really, we never recovered reconciliation um, until the Uluru Statement from the Heart put truth and justice and rights back on the table. And, that, and that's what we mean about taking back control of the reconciliation movement. Thank you for explaining that. Oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> um, Pat, can you take us through the dialogues? Uh, one of the things that, that really struck me with the beautiful Uluru statement was that this was the result of work that has been going for a long time, over a long period of time, involving a lot more people than I initially had understood um, who had come together over various times. Can you just take us through a little bit of the history of the dialogue that got us to this point? It was... Um over 10 years, there'd been about eight different reports. And it came to the situation when um, Mr Turnbull uh, was the Prime Minister and Bill Shorten was the opposition leader. And they got together after all of these, all of these reports and they decided um, to go out and ask, ask uh, Aboriginal people how they wanted to be recognised in the Constitution. This is a bit of a fraught word for us as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. But it, and it was how that we'd be recognised in the Constitution. It was always, when we went out, it was always a, a question of the constitutional reform. Mm -hmm. We didn't invent it. We, were get, was, we had five terms of reference, and that was the first one. How do, and I'm paraphrasing, um, how do Aboriginal people, First Nations people, want to be recognised in the Constitution, number one? And there were four other things that we had to do as well. So that what was that we were taken out as a given, okay? Mm. It was what people wanted, how that was going to be implemented, and over that whole process, uh, many months, uh, was a whole uh, very robust process. Megan and her team uh, designed uh, the process. We didn't want to use the overused, overworked word rec um, consultation. We wanted it to be a conversation, a dialogue exchange of ideas in a respected space. So that came, we came up, or Megan did rather, and her team came up with what was called these regional dialogues. They were a deliberative process with a um, strong education component in it. It was two and a half, almost three days. So that was, that was the format, if you like, the structure under which all of these people um, came together. We decided against town hall meetings like this because in all, everywhere you have a town hall meeting, only the loudest voices get heard. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have a space, a safe space, where people in our communities didn't have a voice, in fact. So the, the people who came to the regional dialogues, they're not going to go on Q&A, mm -hmm. they're not going to go on the drum, they're not going to write opinion pieces, mm -hmm. but they certainly understood their situation and what their needs and priorities were without any doubt at all. We've been the re receivers of all kinds of governments and policies and whatever, so we're fairly sophisticated uh, with the role and function of government. So anyhow, then uh, it was decided, or once again part of the plan, that we would um, have a makeup of different people who come as opposed to just putting a notice in the paper and everybody turning up. That because we wanted to have cultural authority that would underpin the whole process, there we asked for 60% of people had to be um, TOs, traditional owners and custodians of country, 
20% local organisations and regions in the region, because people were also asked to come from the regions, not, and we had several places across, 13 rather, 12 places around the, around, uh, in different, different places, Dubbo, Tasmania, Hobart rather, and so on. So people were going to bring other people, not only lived in Hobart, but around. Some areas it worked better than others, but that was a, that was a plan uh, as well, so people would come uh, to those centres. Um, so, and uh, yes, 60% uh, landowners, 20% organisations, and 20% also of people that perhaps didn't fit those two other criteria, uh, stolen generations, for instance, and other people who were influential uh, in the area but also didn't fit either of those categories. So it was a spread and a mix. We didn't get to everybody, every black fella in the country. Nobody ever has. So it was a spread, a spread of people. Um, the other thing that's really important, because I was co-chairing the referendum council then with Mark Liebler, um, we didn't, in, we, part of the process that Megan had designed, we would find a local host organisation. Uh, so we contracted um, the Aboriginal Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies to do that logistics work for us. So they went out and to all of these regions, we decided the regions beforehand of course, they went out and looked for an organisation that had the capacity to host um, such a meeting. And uh, so they were, they were all selected uh, by uh, the Institute. And um, so then what happened then, they, were set, they set up a, um, a group of a, a workforce of about seven people, um, a man and a woman as a coordinator of the whole, of the whole group. And they would, be the, they would run the regional dialogues. In, there was the same format, same agenda, same time we had a cup of tea um, for the whole, um, whole 13 uh, areas. Because we had to measure. We had to have some way to, to measure as well, to, to honour uh, the terms of reference. So everything... Uh, and then the other thing was that uh, the letter went out. They, the, uh, the host organisation from those categories that I suggest, they selected people because they knew their, their area and they selected people who would fit those different categories. So the referendum council didn't choose anybody. And then what happened though, once those people had been selected, uh, a letter did go out to uh, inviting them to come to, uh, to, this, um, to the regional dialogue in their area. And uh, so that, that was sent out to everybody. Then when the, the team was um, chosen from the local host organisation, we went out and trained everybody tell them what the meeting's about, how it's all going to work, what the expectations are, and so on and so forth. And we had a whole itinerary of different, uh, the different locations. So... It's been an exhausting... It was uh, an exhaustive process. It's a great <coughs> model. Yeah. It, it's a model that really works, and it worked really well, because everybody had a go. Everybody could, uh, could talk. And then uh, each of the terms of reference had a, Megan had a team of um, constitutional lawyers and senior lawyers who went with each of those groups when they became resource people so they could answer questions that people had right there uh, in that uh, the workshop um, situation. So that was once again the same, um, the same in every area. Everything was recorded from that group. They then came back um, to the plenary session. We didn't hand out paper. We put it up so everybody could see what everybody said in that particular group, the whole, like a plenary. And then every sentence was talked through, and in the end, the coordinators would say, is that correct? And some say, no, nah, we want to do it, change this here. We, we, that's what that says, but we really meant this, and so on and so forth. So everybody could see these changes mm. being made up um, on a big screen uh, like this, or big, uh, huge pieces of paper. So, and then when it was, uh, we said, the convener said, is that what you said? You happy with that? And they said, yes, happy with that. We signed off. Took a few hours to get there, though. It well, did. <laughs> I know it's running, it it's sounds rolling like off it's the taken... tongue very easily, but in fact, it was really, really, really in, hard work. In truth, it's been <laughs> years and years and years to get there. And I mean, this is evidence of it being, as I say, a really exhaustive process, which I don't think people had really understood until, no. until this point. Look, there is... One thing more, wait, so you know how you, you... Those people that you saw on the video, the last job that they had, each dialogue, 
was to hold an election, they chose to have an election, to send seven delegates to the convention. So the people that are all on the screen, they'd been through this lengthy process and had been elected by their meeting to go to Uluru, and that's all the people um, mm. you saw there. Now you can go. So... <laughs> <laughs> And, and thank you for explaining that process too, because as I said, it, it, um, it, it, it is so powerful to understand better just how much has gone into the building to this moment. Um, there are a whole lot of things that I want to ask you. I'm, my job here is to ask you the obvious questions that have been floating around um, for some time. Uh, but before we get to them and start chopping through them, and then our audience will come up with some, I do have to ask Auntie Violet, I want to ask you just to tell us briefly why, for, uh, for you as a Ngunnawal elder and, and from our community, why does the voice matter so much to you? The voice matters so much to me and why I really, really support the Yes vote is because it will empower our communities it will give us a chance to re-elect people to sit at the table, to, to negotiate, to advise the government where they've been going wrong. Because the, the, with the closing the gap, I, last time I seen it, there was only four indicators, key indicators that would, was, uh, was addressed and they've reached. So like I always say, I'm 68 year old. My eldest granddaughter is 27, expecting her first baby. Well, she'd be 68-year-old and her granddaughter standing signing and nothing has changed. Mm. So I'm hoping the voice will empower our communities and that the government sits down and listens. Because ADSEC, back in the day, I was an ADSEC councillor. That process was a great process until our abolished it. it was a, we elected people there to represent us. Mm. So I'm open that this is, process would be the same because people will be elected from our communities. People will, because that they see what's going on in the communities 24-7 because they're there living in the communities. Mm. And so they can advise the government on this process where they've been going wrong for many, many years. So that is why I'm supporting The Voice and I'm hoping that Australia will support us all, support us with this yes vote and get us across the line with the referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask some of the, be the devil's advocate here and ask some of the obvious um, questions. But um, Pat, I, I've read you commenting, again, I think it's in today's media, that um, you know, we don't, I think you said, uh, we don't have a say in policy at all. Now, I've heard it said, uh, and in fact, <laughs> I've been shocked at how often I've heard this said, but from a number of people, which is why I raise it, people saying, but there is an Indigenous minister in Parliament, a very good one, and we hear this all the time, there are 11 Indigenous um, representatives in Parliament now too. Why do we need a voice on top of that. Now, I know it's a simplistic question, but, and, and feel free, anyone, to jump in on this. Don't wait to be, all right, well, do, do you want to jump in first? Yeah. No, look, we're really proud of them. But they represent their constituencies, the people who've Bingo. elected them. We all know this, but we're reading in the paper, or, you know, it's, it's the issue. Every time black folks want to do something, the whole, look, everything rains down us from every darn direction. It's. You know this, this is your system, this is the <laughs> democracy. Mm. They represent their constituents. Mm. And, mm. and if they don't do that, they don't get elected again. Uh, it's mm. like it's a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, can you just develop this a little bit further in terms of what's your, what's your, your, um, soundbite answer to why do we need this? I mean, I know you've already touched on this, but, but why a voice to Parliament? Why? And we, we understand the model has been explained through this very, very exhaustive deliberative process, but why a voice to Parliament? Well, I mean, I mean for the reasons you've already mentioned, um, our people don't get a direct say in laws and policies that impact upon their lives. Um, you know, Pat's already alluded to the fact that we don't understand why this argument keeps 
being brought up about the 11 Aboriginal parliamentarians. Um, but, you know, po post ATSIC, there was a, and, 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 and you're right, Arnie, ATSIC did a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, and the nation has kind of just become used to not talking about it. In fact, there's virtually no academic literature at all or empirical studies of ATSIC. But for many blackfellas who worked in it, um, or were representatives of it, um, or the beneficiaries of it, um, it did an extraordinary job. Um, when it was abolished um, uh, at the stroke of a pen with Howard and Latham, um, it, it had a dis disastrous, destructive impact upon communities right across the country. And in, in the work that Pat and I did when we went out and did the dialogues, we heard firsthand from communities in you know, remote, really remote areas about the impact of the um, withdrawal of bush infrastructure. We heard the same stories in regional Australia and urban Australia about um, just how destructive the abolition of ATSIC was. And so then you have this lengthy period up until now that was a vacuum, hey Pat, like just filled with governments um, engaging with um, people who were yes people to the work that they want to do or the policies they want to implement. But in terms of communities, um, what we saw, and you start to see this in th this constitutional process started about 2011. You start to see in some of the um, uh, parliamentary inquiries and the hand side records, this, this discourse coming through from mob about the voicelessness and powerlessness of their people. There's a really striking um, number of transcripts in um, the, the, the Wyatt Paris kind of joint select mm -hmm. parliamentary committee where um, there's one at Shepherd and I think it is where Christian Porter's asking this Aboriginal organisation about section 116A that the expert panel had come up with and subsection B to section 116A and this community member just going, just talking, just saying we're voiceless, we're powerless, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to talk about that because you've introduced the Indigenous Advancement Strategy and you've dismantled all of the policies and programs in my community. And it was just like, you know, ships passing in the night. And, I, and that was at the point I started, this is prior to Referendum Council, designing what a process might look like where we actually went out to communities and asked people, well, what is meaningful recognition to you? If it's not symbolism, which the two major parties kind of had on the table, what does it mean to you? And um, this notion of voicelessness and powerlessness was really palpable in all of the communities. Mm. Um, because Australians are quite shocked to know that actually up until probably Wyatt, the, in, the, in the key agency that deals with Indigenous affairs, there was a few years there where there wasn't a single Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person in the bureaucracy in that particular um, agency. Wow. Um, and so all of the things that Australians also get irritated about that is to say, bureaucracy in Canberra, far away from um, how, where they live their lives and how they live their lives. And you can see this in, in for example, Fred Cheney's reporting to remote and regional Australia. Mm -hmm. Same kind of language about the remoteness of bureaucrats who have no clue about how people live their lives at a grassroots level. And that really imbued, I think, and has, has really fed into this... Um, sentiment that actually an enshrined voice to the parliament, keeping in mind most mob, virtually all mob, don't want to be members of political parties. They don't want to leave their communities. They want to serve their communities. They want to live in their communities. They don't want to become politicians. Most Australians don't want to become politicians. Mm. That is what, sorry. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I stood here sitting good reason. <laughs> That's why it's... That, that's why it's a voice to the parliament, not a voice in the parliament. <laughs> we love well, you, David. David, David, given you're the one who is sitting in, in parliament now, um, can, you, can I just get a comment from you about how you have seen this handled, um, this constant request for more detail, more detail, more detail, and yet even yesterday, for example, the very person asking for the detail... Um, the leader of the opposition wasn't present for the Attorney-General's 
um, uh, reading. Of the reading. So how do you make sense of, or is it possible to make sense of the politics mm. at play here? I find it really disappointing, the lack of leadership and, and vision for how Australia can move forward together and how we can make this actually a unifying moment for our country. Um, obviously wasn't here for the referendum uh, on the Republic, but my understanding is it was a similar strategy. You don't oppose it, but you just, you just continually um, sort of drag it out and say, well, but what about this? Is there enough detail? What about, the, what about the model? Chip away at the model, You slowly yeah. chip away at it. Yeah. And the thing that I've been saying to um, politicians in there is the parliament gets to vote on the model mm. of the voice. Mm. That, that, that's how everything works here, right? You put some things in the constitution that says that, you know, there will be a defence force, um, and then the parliament decides. So mm. <laughs> these politicians who are saying we want more detail, like, they will personally mm. ha potentially have a say in what that detail looks mm. like. Um, it, it's, I find it very frustrating and, mm. and quite disingenuous at this point. Mm. At, at times it has... Forgive me if this seems um, rude, but at times it's been almost comical, the call for detail. <laughs> when the, the Prime Minister has said a number of times, you know, we've met, we've, we've offered all the detail, we've, we've had the discussions, and then there was a, 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 a I think it was a doorstop the other day when the, de the opposition leader was asked about one of the meetings of the Prime Minister, he said, I can't give you the detail, <laughs> which I seemed mean, I, rather ridiculous. And I think that, you know, there is, there is a valid um, call for for detail, we now have the question, and you know, I'm sure we will be see some of the design principles, what it will, you know, what it will look like. Um, but you know, this is this is a process, and I, mm. I think so early on, trying to muddy the waters around what what this will and won't do. When, uh, yeah, mm. it is it's it's been disappointing, but you know, I, I think we're going to start to see the momentum build as, as more Australians see it for, for what it is, a huge opportunity. Let's, let's, um, <laughs> let's go to one of the issues that's been discussed a lot, particularly over the last couple of days, with the refining of the question, I think it was about eight days ago, <coughs> the refining of the question that the Prime Minister first um, floated. Uh, last year, and now, as we know, that's been refined um, somewhat. And look, I was going to get you to read out um, the question, David, but I won't because it's quite long. But in the detail is reference to, and I'll, I'll read this tiny bit, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples goes on to say the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. Now, this has caused a huge amount of discussion, but, but let's just go first to the word executive. Megan, I'd like you to pick up on this because you're the expert. What is... Uh, some? There are constitutional lawyers out there in Australia now who have gone, done backflips over the reference to executive power. Some, not some, some, but they've got a loud voice and they're getting, they're getting traction in certain areas or certain sections of the media. What's your response to that criticism? The, the first thing I would say is it's a handful of lawyers. Yeah. Um, I'll just wait till that first. <laughs> Pick it up. Sorry. Sorry, I'm busy. Thank you. I think Siri Carry on. spoke the <laughs> Um, there's a handful of lawyers who have picked this up. Look, executive has been a part of the drafting for five, six years. It was always a voice to the um, parliament and to the executive for obvious reasons that a, a lot of the um, decision making is not just, it doesn't just happen in the parliament, right? It happens by the government of the day. Um, and so that's really the substance of why that's in the drafting. It, 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 it's become political... In, in this kind of end part, which is fine, people can ask questions. Um, but, I mean, if you don't have the executive at the table, then you're missing out on the, the reason why, or you're, not, you're misunderstanding the reason why the voice needs to be created in the first place. And that is um, 
the lack of accountability of the mm. executive in relation to its decisions and the impact of those decisions upon our communities. Mm. I mean, they are utterly unaccountable. Did you want to add to that? Yeah. I mean, as, as a new parliamentarian, I, I have been shocked by how much is done through delegated legislation by ministers. Yeah. So, you know, an act might set up this framework and then the minister's doing the delegated legislation. Um, and then, obviously, when it comes to the budget, you know, the, the parliament isn't doing all that work. There's a huge amount of power in the executive, and I think it is right and proper that the voice will be able to make representations to them, and that mm. the executive can seek advice on various, mm. various issues, various sort of funding um, mm. ideas or, or budgets. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, think it's, I think it's really important. Yeah, it is. Pat, what, what's your response <coughs> to um, some of those high-profile Indigenous voices that have been very negative about this? Mm. Um, uh, and, and it would seem to be you know, creating a wedge in what we thought was a cohesive approach um, post Uluru. What, what's your response to them? Do you all agree mm. all the time on every single issue? Absolutely not. My That's husband's sitting out there somewhere. No. <laughs> That's for starters. It's a little bit much to expect that every black fella in the country thinks the same. That's not going to happen. And it's never happened. We've never all thought the same. You know, when the fir those first boats came, there were like 700 languages. Doesn't that tell you that there might be sort of 700 different types of people, mm. for starters? Mm. Second starter. Um, <laughs> everyone's in. Look, and there's a, a high degree of suspicion. And What's that suspicion about, though? What, what all of you? Oh. And everything that's happened to us. <laughs> everything that's happened to us. Oh. Oh, there's no other answer. You know, this is a long history here, and it's a bloody one, and it's a cruel one. Mm. And that's what we're trying to fix, to sort of get over this so we can get on with a mature and sophisticated nation. Mm. There is no doubt about it. We've got a lot of dirty work to do here. Can I, can I put to, or ask you, um, is it possible, and I've heard this said also um, by other Indigenous people, that, that it's, it, it's a bit of an easy way out, the voice is a bit of an easy way out for white Australia, or non-Indigenous Australia, I should say, um, uh, to make people feel, non-Indigenous Australians feel like, yes, OK, we go to the referendum, we vote, yes, we've, we've dealt with that. And, and the, the, the issue of, of the horror of Australia's, of the truth of Australia's past, the very thing that, that Noel Pearson has been talking about we must face up to, um, uh, isn't dealt with, but people feel like it has been. Is that... Does that it's have 12, any... It's been 12 years to get to this point, mm. and we have to go to a referendum in which only eight out of 44 have been successful. This is not an easy task that we're doing. It's not going to make... We, have to, we still have to talk to Australians to, get, yeah. to convince them and persuade yeah. them that the Uluru Statement that we issued to Australians six years yeah. ago um, is something that they should support us on. Mm. I mean, we went to Aussies because because of the nature of retail Australian politics, which reduces any substantive reform, especially in our area, um, to very little. Um, I don't know who would be saying it's an easy out. It, it's not an easy out at all. This is a lot of hard No, work. I, I meant actually an easy out for non-Indigenous well, Australians to it, say, OK, the issue's dealt with now, let's move So can I just move, make move one on. point about truth-telling? It, it's a complete and utter myth that you need to do truth-telling to have a treaty. It's a complete and utter myth that you need truth-telling to get to rights. It, it's, it's, it, there is no treaty process in the world that has required a truth-telling process first. None, not a single one. Do you need treaty before voice, though? No, you don't. Why? You don't, for, for all sorts of reasons. So let me start. So at Uluru, <laughs> so at Uluru treaty was on the table. People didn't choose treaty, treaty first. So if we have a look at the process that's underway in Australia, treaty is being done at a state level and it's being done in legislation. Um, what we know in terms of the federal system and the constitution is that the Commonwealth 
trumps state legislation, and so all of those treaties are vulnerable to Commonwealth override. Three provisions in the Australian Constitution that can override treaties that will be done in legislation at a state and territory level. What we heard in the dialogues from, as Annie Pat said, 60% of the invitations were to our elders, our cultural authority, our old people, Aboriginal culture, our people, we're, we're a gerontocracy. We're a collective, but we're a gerontocracy where our decision-making is done by our old people. Um, and in those discussions, they said that a lot of our people weren't ready to engage with the state on treaty. Treaties are really complex legal agreements, really complex. And we live in a state right across the continent in which we are not in a position, most mob, to enter into a treaty with the Crown. Mm. We don't have the resources. We don't have the money. If you look at British Columbia and their post-colonial treaty process, you had nations that were given up to $40 million to go away, hire lawyers, and do the work of treaty making. Look at the Queensland process. There's no money on the table. It is the Crown representing the Crown and the Crown representing the mob. So, so our people are pretty wise people. We understand how politics works, how the law works, and we understand that right now our people are not in a position or at the threshold of being able to engage in treaty making with the state. So, you know, treaties are really complex. Mm. So treaties will happen. Our mob want treaties, but the offer on the table to, from the Australian government and the Australian people for 12 years has been constitutional recognition and treaties don't happen in the Australian Constitution. So, so that's some of the decision-making or the reasoning behind why, treat, why we weren't going to just abandon constitutional recognition for, for treaty. The other reason is, is that our people have been dragged through the courts through a native title determination process that has ripped vast numbers of communities across this country apart. Mm -hmm. We have a problem in terms of the social cohesion of our people because native title processes have driven our people apart. They've driven nations apart and families apart. And most Aussies don't get to see that, that side of native title. Um, some groups have got really substantive native title um, decisions and determinations, but, but not all. Mm. And, and when we went to places like Dubbo, and when we went to places like Sydney, and you know, people were saying they're not talking to family, they're not talking to each other, because of what that process has done in terms of who and who is and isn't a traditional owner under that system that is driven by anthropologists and historians and judges. So, so to understand that decision making around voice and treaty, you have to be really kind of deeply embedded in the Aboriginal community to understand that point. That's why voice is before treaty. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautifully put, thank you. <laughs> I, um, I am going to throw it over to you, and I know some of you do have questions, and there is, as I said, a mic uh, standing at the side there. Please keep your question short, sharp, and to the point, <laughs> and one question per person. That's um, the plea of every... I oh, know. I've got to say it anyway. <laughs> but no, please do, um, and no long... Well, we're in Canberra, and people like to get up and make long dissertations. <laughs> <laughs> We ain't got time for that, folks. Um, although I know you're terribly intelligent, most of you know, know a huge amount more than I do. But just keep it really tight, please. So we've got uh, first. I'm sorry, I can't see you. So we've got the first question. I think you just put your hand up. It's me, Virginia Astrid. Oh, hello, Astrid. I can't see you, but far away, Astrid. I know it'll be a nice, tight question. Hi. Um, I'm wondering when the voice is passed, and we know it will be, hopefully. How are we going to incorporate every single land council in Australia? Because what affects what? someone in Inverell might not affect someone in, say, Kempsey. Land council. A Astrid, I didn't quite pick up the, the, the bit about the land council. Can you just say that again? We didn't quite hear it. When the voice is passed, yep. how are we going to efficiently make sure that every land, ca land council or every <laughs> mob get their problems in their community costs, because what affects someone in Kamilori country won't exactly affect okay. the yeah, same Okay, yeah, no, I can answer that. that. It's a, that's a really good question. Can I Thanks, answer Thanks, Astrid. Yeah, please, yeah. please, go ahead. Thank um, you. So that's an important question. Look, um, can I just begin by saying 
the land councils across the nation support the voice, yeah? Um, but we also heard in the dialogues a lot of mobs say that the land councils don't rep represent their interests. So this, this voice is not necessarily about having those peak bodies as the voices of the people, but what we heard was that mob want their own voice. They want their own voice to be heard. So land councils are heard through all sorts of mechanisms, whether it's at a state government level or at a federal level, because they are land councils. Will they have a sole voice? On, no, this voice will be the voice of grassroots mob who don't want other entities and organisations to talk on their behalf anymore. That, that's the whole purpose of it. So when you, but, but I think the point, the important point you're making is, you know, what mob, um, you know, want on the APY lands is not the same as what mob want in Logan City. Mm. And I think our, our peoples are cognizant of that too meaning um, in terms of the structure, and there will be a process after the referendum in which our people can contribute to what the design of the voice will look like, um, that, that issue will be raised, because it was raised in the dialogues. It's the whole purpose of why the voice is being argued for. So it's a really important point, but, but we too understand the point that you're making. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid, <coughs> and it's lovely to see you up and about and looking well. Thank you. Um, the next question. Um, thank you for hosting this panel. It's a really interesting discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, on November 20, 2022, Professor Megan David admitted to the National Press Gallery, um, and I quote, we banned significant leaders from the movement because of their cynicism towards government from the dialogues beginning December 2016 onwards, informing the statement of the heart. Will that banning of Aboriginal voices who disagree with government be replicated in the formation of the voice to Parliament? Did you hear all of that? I, I think the question was, will Aboriginal people who don't agree with government be able to be elected to the voice? Was that the question? Um, I think it was... It's about the quote saying that... Can, can, you, just from stand, the can you stand back from the mic a little bit? It's a little bit hard up here to hear you. Just stand back a little bit, don't go close to it, and, and just, just <coughs> paraphrase what you're saying. The quote, it, there's no sound, but oh. um, the quote is that we banned significant leaders from the movement because of their cynicism towards government. Oh, okay, government. got it. Oh, we, yeah. We, yeah, we banned... So, so what I meant was in the dialogues. So when we ran the dialogues, we wanted people to participate who didn't have a voice. So what we were really cognizant of was mob who are kind of professional lobbyists. You know, they've got those passes and they get to Parliament House and they get in without signing in, right, like the rest of it. <laughs> so they, we, they are on a register, though. They have to be registered. Yeah, so we yeah. wanted to make sure that the people in the dialogues aren't people who already had a voice. Yeah. So that's why, you know, some land council leaders would get up and say, you're wasting your time. Yeah? Government's never going to do anything. Yeah. You know, let's just stop this process. What we didn't want was to lose the opportunity of running the dialogues and having our mob think of a reform that meets the issues in their communities. Um, and so we didn't allow people who were significantly... So this person I was referring to, the question you're asking from the National Press Club, is a very prominent Aboriginal leader and he's been involved in the movement and all of these processes for 40 years. Mm. So, so, yeah, he was, he was cynical about it, but... but we, we did talk to mob, as Pat would know, and say, you know, we're about to embark on this process of constitutional recognition. We've been, we've been given this opportunity. And law reform is a really difficult thing because law reform does require you to suspend your disbelief that the nation can't change. Mm. Law reform mm. does absolutely require you to imagine that the world can be better mm. and that you can dream of a better day. And so... There was a lot, as Pat would know, after this particular dialogue, there were a lot of very upset young people in that dialogue, community mob, who said, <coughs> said, we came along to this because we thought, you know, we'd be able to contribute, and he's just said they're not going to listen. And mm. I said, well, you said, we said, mm. they might not listen, but this process is in train, and for us to get change, we have to imagine mm. that Australia can change. We have to dream of a better day for your grannies, 
you know, for your children. And so we're asking you to suspend your disbelief. And, and, and Broome was a very difficult dialogue, Pat. There are a lot of women there who've had children removed, mm. children who had um, committed suicide, a lot of people who were in youth detention. And it's not an easy thing, you know, to go to communities and talk about reform and to talk about constitu a constitution to a community. Um, and so we said to them, just, you, you know, law reform is an exercise in imagination. Mm -hmm. and, and this nation's constitution can change. It's built to change. We know that as mob because we did it in 1967, the highest yes vote in Australian history. But you must suspend your disbelief and exercise your imagination and, and let's do this work. And as Pat, Pat knows, the next day, Pat, they came, they rolled up their sleeves. And from that dialogue right across the nation, the men and women of the dialogues did such an extraordinary job, right? They dreamt of a better day. Mm. They suspended their disbelief that Australia can't change. And they invoked our people, now ancestors and people still alive, who led that 67 referendum with Aussies, um, and, and exercised their agency and their imagination to come up with quite an extraordinary reform. Mm. And this reform, this voice to parliament and what they designed, because at the time it kind of danced between a race power and a non-discrimination clause, they came up with a change, a reform that no constitutional lawyer had conceived of prior to the dialogues. And, and so that was the point that I was trying to make at the National Press Club. That is... The, <coughs> the question is about, will these same dissenting voices or people who may have oppositional voices, I guess, to the voice now and maybe to issues that the voice will discuss, will they also be banned from participating? So, so mm. if mob, vote them in, yes. I'm going to have to... The, the, but, but it's an important point. Mm. We're not excluding people who disagree with government. There were many ATSIC... I mean, Violet knows this. There were many ATSIC people oh, that were counselor. elected that don't agree with government. <laughs> we all don't agree Most with government. Most of our mob don't we agree with government. Generations. <laughs> but our mob will vote them in, yeah? So they'll vote them in. OK, and thank you for the question. Um, we'll take another one. And again, keep it short and sharp, please. practical advice for um, all of us here for when we leave tonight, when we're engaging with our friends, family members and colleagues on things that we can do and say to be positive advocates for a positive result in the um, referendum. Great question. Could I ask all of you just to give us a, a short answer <coughs> to that? Um, because I'm, I'm sure you've all got an answer to it, but a, a, and we're going to run out of time, but just a short answer. David, can you pick up on that first and foremost? What, what are you telling people to take away tonight? This is an invitation to all of us. Um, you know, the history is calling. Like, we, we have an opportunity to be part of history here and set um, our country up to begin to change the, the way that we are dealing with these issues and to allow Australia's first peoples to have a voice on issues that affect them. To me, that, that's, that's what it comes, comes down to. And Barnett, what, what do you want people to do when they leave here tonight? I want people to think about it. So we need to make change, we need to make a difference. Like I said, you have got grannies. <laughs> and have, think about the next generations and the next generations. I want my grand, great-grandchildren to walk beside their friends and not let them see there's a difference between us. We are proud Aboriginal people, proud First Nations people, but we're also proud Australians. So let's work into the future to make a difference. Please support this yes vote, because it will make a difference for my people. Did you, do you want to add to that, Pat? I will quickly, <laughs> because it's going to be very short. But I'm not confident that you really all understand here. We're yeah. not doing this as some kind of intellectual exercise here. We're getting, we, want, we need to get down to the disadvantage that continues to plague our families and our communities to varying degrees across the country. I'm from the Northern Territory and we have problems like you wouldn't believe, generation after generation. We have a couple of generations who can't read and write. 
We put 10-year-old boys in spit hoods and put them in jail in a cell where they've had pedophiles and murderers. So imagine that kind of energy. And these boys are 10. These are babies. Now, there's all kinds of things like that happen. So we need to be able to say, hang about. Don't, same with the intervention in the Northern Territory. We might have said to the governor of the day, don't do that. Let's do this instead, and so on and so on and so forth. Nobody cares whether our kids go to school or not in the Northern Territory, they don't. That's for sure. We got to, look, it's endless, it's endless. <coughs> so that's what this is all about. And as people sit in the dialogues, the only way we can get any traction, they didn't use that word, the only way we can get change here is to use their big law and the uh, people knew and understood about the power of the Constitution, because it's your power. You have the power, yeah. not the government of the day. That's why the, the Uluru said was gifted to you. You have to decide what kind of a nation we are. What are our values? What do we stand for? And that's what's on the, t on the, table, on the table now. So my message to you, we can't get, we are never going to get to all of the misinformation and disinformation. But let me tell you, it's all, it's, it's to disrupt and to create, um, un, you know, confusion. It's to create confusion so you don't know what the hell to believe in the end. Yeah. Um, so my message to you tonight is when you get in that ballot box at the end of the year, there's just you and your conscience. And you have to decide there's only one answer, yes or no, and take responsibility where you vote. <laughs> Virginia, Virginia, well, well, um, so, can I just say one more thing? Of course. Do you know tonight in Tamworth there is a meeting just like this for the people that are speaking out and saying no? It is Alan Jones, Pauline Anson, and Barnaby Joyce. <laughs> and so I ask these people, what are you, why do you, are you against us? Don't worry, Auntie Violet, apparently no one turned up. Oh, um, God. <laughs> well done, Virginia. Yeah. I know. No, we'll, we'll move it on. Um, I want to go to the next questioner, but one thing I have been delighted by, or many things about um, you know, having these discussions and, and the fact that we are seriously, seriously beginning to, well, I hope, move towards a voice. I think a lot of Australians didn't even understand that we had a constitution. And I've been shocked to hear people make reference to the Constitution as if it's an American Constitution yeah. and we have a First Amendment. I mean, mm. or I'll take the fifth. I mean, at, at least this is getting us focused. You know, if, if uh, well, not if nothing else, but it is getting us focused on what, what is our Constitution? What does it mean? And, what's, and as you just said, Pat, you know, what is our responsibility as members of Australia, all of us, what is our responsibility in relation to the Constitution? Let's just take one, uh, another question here, and short, sharp. Thank you very much, everybody. I just want to ask a question about something that's made me feel a little bit uneasy. Um, big businesses such as BHP, who have uh, applied to destroy over 30 sacred sites, NAB, conservative organisations like the Ramsey Foundation, have come out in support of The Voice. I'm interested um, on your opinions on how these organisations with historically poor track records, um, how they have uh, shed light on why they are willing to support The Voice. Professor Davis, do you have a response to that? Well, there's all sorts of organisations that are supporting The Voice. There are mining companies that are supporting The Voice. In, in the work that we've done um, with the dialogues, there's a very different um, discourse among our mob, and this played out during the dialogues, and it's playing out today in terms of our advocacy work across the country, in terms of um, uh, uh, mob in WA having different relationships with mining companies to, to people on the East Coast. Um, and that's been something, as Pat knows, has been um, difficult, but also important for us to grapple with as we lead this work across the country, um, where we have Uluru youth and elders, Pat, in, in WA who, 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 who want to take money from mining companies because they have agreements with them, um, they work with them, 
um, as opposed to mob in the East Coast who say we're not going to take money from those companies and we're not going to engage with them. Um, and so it, it depends on where you're in the country as to that. I think the question's important, but when I think about, say, FNQ, Far North Queensland, 83 PVCs, huge numbers of illiwas, the biggest native title footprint in the country, and they're all engaging with mining companies and resource extraction in particular ways. Not all of them, but um, you know, we've had to adopt a, a, a kind of nuanced approach across, um, across, across the country. Um, and on Ramsey, I, you know, that's not something that we're um, involved with or cognizant of, but um, I, I take your point. Thanks, Jim. I don't know if Pat wants to add to that. But. Pat, did you want to answer? Uh, Just quickly, respond to that? you know, if we had a voice, it wouldn't be so easy, um, Rio Tinto, was it? That blew up the cave? Mm. Junkin Gorge? Well, you know, that <laughs> it wasn't just destroying the culture for that group of people, for the whole of the country, but habitation in that ca cave had something to say about human habitation on the planet, and they just blew it up. Now, I don't think a voice would quite let that happen. Mm. There's a lot of, Hopefully. sorry, but there are a lot of things that could have been done and yeah. should have been done, including yeah. constitutionally, that didn't happen because there was no voice in Canberra coordinating a response to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which really goes to the heart of the question too, as to what, how will you know this is working um, when it's in practice? But yes, in response to something like that, it's a really good example. Um, I'm going to jump forward to another question. I think we've got time for one more. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for organising this. And thank you, panel, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, look, I'm here to understand, to improve my own understanding, but also I want to go back, take these messages. As you said, there's a confusion we all know out there. Uh, fortunately, I'm in a position to influence through my community to actually understand this issue, but also vote in favour. So I can understand there's one, I mean, there's a lot of material out there, and. Uh, those of you who haven't heard, there's a good report yesterday, was it yesterday, I think, law report on Kenneth Hain answered um, half an hour session on this, and beautifully, I know, yeah. I, all the legal questions, concerns I had were blown away because I listened to an, you know, justice. Uh, to, um, Can you shoot to your question? I'm I, sorry, I will, we're I running out of time. I will, I will, I will. I'm coming to the, the question is really, uh, the referendum recognition I can understand. I want to know from you, Megan, and all of the experts here, what <coughs> I, I think it will sail through, we will get through that vote. Uh, what impact, real impact, you will see in two years' time, in five years' time, real difference in terms of education, health, condition, living, all of that? How, you know, because one of the things is they can always, government, exude, can always listen and ignore okay. representation. Okay, I, I think we've got the question. I mean, it's sort of been dealt with, but do you want to just give a quick response I think, to that? I mean, I mean it, it, it's, it's a good question. The only, I suppose, two points. Everyone should listen to that law report <laughs> interview with Ken Hayne because it's really excellent. So um, when we talk about the constitutional objections to ex the executive power, it's a very small number, handful of lawyers. The Law Council of Australia, Brett Walker, you know, numerous... So, so listen to Ken Hayne on the law report, because I, I, I agree with you, he cleans up the, the nonsense about the executive power so well. But on your point about the two-year, three-year, ten-year progress, look, I, I think any community in the world or any country in the world that has significant Indigenous populations has found substantial um, um, improvements in disadvantage and, 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 um, and, and people's lives where they've got Indigenous peoples contributing to those laws and policies. Right now, you don't have mob involved. One of the big things about the voice is that we're not asking the voice to be running around when the bells are ringing or policies are at the tail end. It's to create a new culture in Canberra <laughs> where mob are consulted from, from the absolute yes. genesis of an idea or a policy or a law. So it's to change the entire normative framework of engagement with First Nations peoples on laws and policies that impact them. Right now, it's an afterthought, and, and constitutionally, it makes us there at the table from day one. Mm -hmm. changing, changing that process of, of how policies conceived, designed, developed, changing the normative process for 
every policy for everyone would be fantastic. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. maybe this is the way to do it. We are going to um, have to wind up, but I've got a couple of things uh, just to, to share with you before we do, uh, including a very short clip. But before we do, David, I want to just come back to you because, once again, you're the person sitting in Parliament House. Therefore, you've got, a, I think, a, a, a strong feeling for how this is panning out from the, from the political perspective. Um, as we get closer to referendum day, it's going, I guess, like any election process, it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. And because we know this opposition, it's going to get even more bitter. What's, what's your gut feeling now at this stage as to how, um, how, how is the mood around this, this issue, the voice? Do, and do you think um, we might see a change from the opposition is that possible in terms of support, do you think? I'm not sure what, what, what they'll do. I know there are people within that, in the party trying to shift their, their view. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to do. This is going to take all of us mm. really yes. having yeah. conversations. Yeah, that's how change happens. No, mm. if, 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 this, if this was easy, you know, it would have happened a long time ago. Change is hard. And I think you look at previous referendums, and it does take um, all of us really, in many ways, getting out of our comfort zones and having conversations, uh, talking about what it means, ensuring that we are talking about the practical elements of how this is going to change the way that politics is done in Australia, and set us up for you know, future generations to hopefully really benefit from this. Mm. Thank you for that, David. I, what I have gleaned from tonight are well, many things, but the, the focus on the optimism of imagination is actually quite exciting. To What you said, um, Megan, about law reform requires you to suspend your disbelief that things can change. Um, and law reform requires imagination. These, these are actually exciting ideas, optimistic ideas, hopeful ideas. Um, and so it's lovely to, it's really lovely to hear you express it that way. Um, before we do close though, uh, and I'm going to come back, we're going to come back with a, a QR code that's going to give you some more information should you require it. But I believe we have a short video um, for closing. We'll play that. I've got a story to tell you. It's a good one. It's about how these people, the first people, got a voice. 60,000 years they've been speaking had 363 languages. But no voice, no say of matters which affected them. It wasn't right. So, me and your granddad. Me and your mum. The whole nation did something about it. People called their friends and families. People talked about it on the streets, talked about it at work, on the field. Everybody made a song and dance about it. Everyone walked side by side. And that's how we changed this country for the better. How we made history. Is that story true? It could be. Mm. It could be. It could be. It's up to all of us. It could be. What a beautiful, beautiful way to close. Now, if you are interested in joining the support campaign, um, you can just scan this QR code. It's also on the postcards that were on your seats uh, when you came in, and it, you, it's available on the website too, I believe. Um, but if you scan that, it will give you a whole lot more information about how you can join the uh, the Yes campaign, become a supporter and, and get active. And as we've heard tonight over and over again, it is about all of us. Um, we all really have a job to do and it starts with talking and listening with, with great respect. And on that note, I want to thank our fabulous panel and how lucky have we been here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Auntie Violet. Auntie Pat, 
Professor Megan Davis and David Pocock, many, many thanks. And thank you to you for coming. Well done, Canberra. We know you'll do the right thing. Now, use your voice, go out, talk, talk, and more talk. What are we going to do? Well, vote. Yes! <laughs> thank you, Canberra. Thank you. No, thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Madam.